This is Unto Deepest Steps, my new strategy game, and over the next few videos, I'll be discussing various aspects of the game's development, starting today with the application architecture and some code snippets showing how all of this fits together. If you're a regular viewer, you may be wondering why I'm not discussing my previous tactics game. The short answer is that my partner's doing 90% of the artwork for that game, but she has less time to devote to game development than I do. So while the game is in a good place technically, it's gonna be a little while before it's ready for a proper public unveiling. So I've decided to put it on the back burner for a bit, fired up a sprite, and started on this smaller scale concept I've been wanting to explore for a little while now. We'll be back with more info on the kaiju game at a later date. So first up, what is Unto Deepest Steps? It's a dark fantasy strategy game with a minimal yet challenging rule set. Each turn, every unit must move and must attack. As each unit has unique rules about where it can move and attack, and friendly fire is very much a thing, the player must strategize about not only how to position their units to defeat their opponent, but also how to protect their units from one another and what the impact of moving to a location this turn will be in future turns since they'll be moving again shortly. Additionally, units have very little health and can typically only take one or two hits before dying, so every turn is important since there's little room for error. This is a sort of back-to-basics concept I've been wanting to explore for a while now, something that strips the strategy genre down to strategic positioning and doesn't get bogged down into much complexity. It's not a large scope game by any means, but as someone who enjoys simple strategy games that can be played in a single sitting, I'm hoping other out there will find enjoyment in the concept as well. Plus, I think the dark fantasy atmosphere is fun, especially when the post-processing effects are laid on top of it all, and it's paired with a nice, crunchy retro soundtrack thanks to my recent discovery of Super Audio Card. To round out the game overview, Unto Deepest Steps will offer both fixed challenges and a roguelite mode where you'll grow and manage a party of adventurers, fight your way through procedurally generated battles, challenge bosses, and respond to random events along the way. And just for fun, you'll have the choice of playing as both the humans fighting off the dark creatures or as those creatures fighting off the humans. If this sounds interesting to you, you can wishlist it below, but for now, let's talk code. If you've seen my devlogs for LMX or the Kaiju game, then you'll have a good idea of how I've decided to structure my game's code, though I have made some incremental improvements to it, which I'll discuss when appropriate over this and the next few videos. To start with, here's the node structure of a typical level, slightly abbreviated for clarity. The top level node coordinates level initialization, generation, and listens for win-loss conditions, but delegates all major work to its children as appropriate. The vast majority of its code is dedicated to just initializing the level in the correct order and passing in some high-level dependencies. The level generator node generates the level for procedurally generated battles. I'll discuss this node more in a later level, but for now I'll add that it's always present but is optionally triggered so that I can have one scene structure for both fixed levels where I've placed tiles and objects manually and for procedurally generated levels. The various nodes between the level generator and the units are the nodes that take care of anything that isn't a unit but needs to be displayed within the world space. Objects in particular is where any objects that don't fit elsewhere in the 2D space go. Teleporters that can move units around, exploding mushrooms, and so on. The units node and its children are where the bulk of the level's logic occurs. After everything has been initialized, the units node starts running the main game loop of taking turns on the battlefield and waiting for one side to come out victorious. This node cycles through its child unit groups, informs them that it's their turn, and then listens for a signal that the turn is complete and that the next group may go. It also takes care of cross-group logic, such as answering the question, where are all the active units on the map, and resolving attack outcomes since attacks can hurt a unit in any group, and some objects in the world are also affected by attacks. Keep in mind that it doesn't necessarily perform these tasks, as it delegates where relevant, but it is the place to go for these types of things. Unit groups are concerned with managing all units on the same side of the battle. This mostly involves managing turn order when it's that group's turn, cycling through all active units, and listening for signals from a given unit. It can also answer questions like, where are the active units in this specific group? The various units are the individuals on the battlefield. We'll discuss them in depth another time, but just know that in the context of the overall level structure, they emit signals that their unit group listens to, informing it of that unit's actions, such as moving, attacking, being defeated, and so on, so that the unit group can respond accordingly. 
The last piece, which isn't shown in this diagram, is a number of autoloads that help support everything. These include event buses, mostly for communicating UI events from deep within the scene tree, a few globally accessible functions for looking up data, such as getting a list of the interactive objects in the level, and the navigation space, which is built using Godot's A-Star 2D class. I use A-Star 2D rather than the existing grid-oriented A-Star Grid 2D class, as there are special navigation use cases I need to support that A-Star Grid 2D isn't a good fit for, at least as of the writing of this video. In particular, teleporters that can take you to a matching tile somewhere in the level don't work. With the basic A-Star 2D class, I can just connect two arbitrary nodes anywhere in the navigation graph to one another, such as the two ends on the teleporter, and now the AI and pathfinding knows how to work with them. One other key thing to note about this architecture is that this is all event-driven. There's very little code running every frame, and the code that is isn't related to managing or executing the primary game loop. Pretty much everything runs on signals, which makes it easy to branch or vary code execution for little work. Player and AI units both emit the same signal when they're moving, for instance, but whereas an AI-controlled unit can just move, a player-controlled unit can kick things out to the UI, wait for the player to make a selection, and then rejoin the same path the AI-controlled unit would take. I do sometimes have to be mindful of race conditions if a signal gets fired the same frame its parent logic is called, but that's a relatively straightforward edge case to handle. And that's the high-level structure of the game. While the internals have changed a bit over time, this has become my standard template for a strategy game, and I don't see much need to change it with the games I make. Looking at the critical path of level to all units to unit groups to specific units, this structure divides the work into partitions that represent both the game flow and the logical separation of code concerns. The level can dictate when to begin or end play, the unit's container can decide whose turn it is, the unit groups can decide what to do on their turn and when their turn is over, and the units themselves can drive their own behavior. I've used this format for turn-based combat in Kaiju Clash, tactical strategy with LMX and the Kaiju Tactics game, and even a roguelike golfing game as I find this to be a fairly flexible system that works well for me in most turn-based scenarios. So with the high-level design out of the way, let's take a deeper look into how all of this is actually implemented by stepping through the code driving the game loop. As with the architecture diagrams, I will be slightly simplifying things so that we don't get lost into the weeds, as do you really need to see that I start playing music when a level loads? But what I'm going to show in this section is an accurate reflection of how the game code operates in order to manage and operate turns. So first things first, what happens when a player loads a level ready to take on the forces of evil? Let's take a look at the ready function of my top level node for the entire scene. The first thing to do is generate the level, if needed, as there are multiple nodes that need to work with the final level output. As I mentioned previously, level generation will get its own video, but what's relevant here is that the level generator is self-contained. There are a few exported variables so it can write its output to the correct nodes, and it accesses a few resources so that it knows what its generation goals are, but that's it. After that, there's a curious call to the seed function, but the reason is quite simple. There's a limited number of places in the game code where a number may be generated or an array is shuffled. But since this is a game with little room for error, I want the game to be deterministic. Assuming all else is the same, taking the same action should result in the same outcome every time you play the same level. So I set the global seed to a fixed number to remove any variation in results. After the level is generated, it's time to start initializing everything else in the game. The navigation autoload is where pathfinding is managed, so I grab the level tile map and pass it to it so that it can set up the A-Star 2D instance I need. That second parameter, get active units, is a callable that navigation can use to look up active units on the board and help answer line of sight questions that require information on both the tile map and units. Once pathfinding is ready, the scene starts listening for a signal informing it that only one team is left and that battle is over, triggering UI and other effects as necessary. After that, the remaining nodes get initialized with whatever they require. The camera positions itself to the center of the game map, the units node connects up various signals, the object node initializes whatever nodes it has as appropriate, and then the battle begins. Now we're ready to fight, so let's dive in deeper into the units node and start looking at what the standard game loop looks like. As mentioned previously, this node exists to manage the turn order between groups. In Unto Deepest Depths, there's only the player and their opponent, but the system supports any number of groups by storing them in an array that it will iterate and loop over. On initialization, Units grabs all of its unit group children, adds them to a queue, initializes them, and listens for the turn complete signal. This signal connects to a function which just checks if there's more than one group that's still alive. If so, gameplay continues and the next group takes its turn. 
If not, the node emits a signal telling the top level scene node that there's no more battle to be had and whether or not the player won by checking if the player's group has any active units remaining. When it's time to step forward in the turn queue, units simply increases the value of current group index, looping back to zero if necessary, and sees if the next group in the queue still has active units. If it doesn't, it goes on to the next group and tries again. Since this function is only triggered when more than one group is active, I know I'll get a different group than the one I started with as long as I loop far enough. Not exactly necessary for this game with its two groups, but I'm trying to keep some low cost flexibility to the architecture so I can reuse this in other projects. And that's how units manages turn order. This node also does a few other things like listening for if a group is defeated mid-turn, in case friendly fire or similar kills the group, and helps pass signals around regarding attacking, but I'm going to ignore those for now to instead stay focused on the main game loop. Inside of the unit's container are two unit groups, one for the player and one for the opponent. These nodes house the individual units for each team and coordinate turn logic between them. That coordination, combined with the fact that units rarely, if ever, directly operate on things outside of their scope, means that there's a lot of code here to drive the UI for the player-controlled units, such as displaying move options, handling unit selection, and so on. I'll touch on that code as appropriate, but won't go too in-depth, as it mostly consists of getting some data and firing signals through a global event bus so that the UI can respond. So let's take a look at what we're working with here. At the top of the class, we can now see where the signals that tell the parent units node what this group is doing are defined. There's a signal to let it know when a turn is complete, one to let it know when an attack has been made so that units can pass that data to the opposing group, and a signal for when there are no more active units. I also have some variables to help me track this group's state, such as the current unit being operated on, the index of that unit among its children, which is used by the AI as it just iterates through all of its children on its turn, and a collection of the actions under current consideration, which is used for UI purposes, such as checking if a click on the map is valid, and if so, which action should be executed. Wrapping up this top section, on initialization, I loop through all of the units that belong to each group, initialize them, and connect to a few signals regarding their health. Other signals, such as what actions are being taken, are connected when that specific unit becomes the active unit. So now let's skip to where turns are managed. When it's a unit group's turn, I reset the index for looping through units, inform each unit that they should reset any turn-based state that they may have, and then move on to stepping through the units, which is where things get a little more interesting. And in case you're wondering, I set current unit index to negative 1 just as a convenience so that I can do a simple addition when stepping through the units and have the index at 0 for the first turn. I start out a specific unit's turn by clearing any highlights that may be on the map, again calling a signal through the global event bus, and taking a short break the duration of turn cooldown so that there's a beat to take in the outcome of whatever came before. Afterwards, the player and the AI go through two very different processes. For the player, everything flows through the UI to drive the turn. As any unit can be chosen in any order, the player group grabs all units that haven't taken a turn, highlights their cells, and then listens for a click in one of those cells. When a cell has been clicked, it marks that as the current unit and then lets the player select their movement, again doing a loop through the UI to let the player select their target cell, confirming it's a valid cell, and then letting them move. After moving, a unit has to attack, and the same loop is done once more. Highlight cells, click cell, resolve attack. I recognize that I'm glossing over the code for this section, but that's because it is all variations of the same thing. For the AI, everything is much simpler. The group selects the next active child, marks it as the current unit, and tells it to take its next action, whether that be moving or attacking. As the unit itself tracks what it has or hasn't done on a turn, the unit group has very little to do for AI units. And now let's jump very briefly to units themselves. While I will discuss them in detail another time, I want to touch on them here for completeness of the game loop and just show their signals. As you might could infer, each signal here ties into what we've seen in the previous sections. There's a signal to mark that movement has been completed so that the turn can be stepped, but also signals for starting and ending an attack animation. Attack complete is what drives the turn order so that the full animation is played before moving on, but attack beginning is also useful to help drive certain effects. Unit defeated ties into the turn order, or even marking that group as having lost the battle. And damaged is used primarily because there are visual effects applied when a unit, whether good or bad, takes damage. And that's a look at how level startup and turn order are managed in Unto Deepest Steps. In future videos, I will show more details about how units themselves work, how levels are generated, and more. But this hopefully gives you an idea of how I've structured my code for the core game loop. One last thing I'd like to point out though is that relative to the genre, this is a fairly simple game from a technical perspective, so the code here may not apply for all strategy games or for your strategy game, but it's perfectly appropriate for the scope I have here. Thanks for watching.